Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So we started the letter to the Philippians last week. Um, we stopped somewhere in the middle of chapter 2. Uh, so um, we saw that the Philippian church was uh, reached during the second missionary journey of Paul. Uh, Paul and his team were actually planning on going to Asia Minor. That was the plan which they had made humanly. And so even as they were trying to go towards Asia Minor, uh, again and again, the Holy Spirit stops them because the Lord has got something else in mind. And then uh, Paul has his vision in which he sees a man from the Macedonian region, which would basically be our Europe today. So uh, he, see, he sees a man in the vision saying, come and help us. And uh, so uh, in that way, God directs them to go to, um, to enter into Europe instead. Uh, so it's during the third missionary journey that they reach out to Asia Minor. So it was not the Lord's timing for them uh, to uh, go into Asia Minor during the second missionary journey. Maybe the uh, hearts of the people would not have been ready at that particular time. Uh, maybe there was a greater need uh, in Macedonia you know, uh, during the time of the second missionary journey. So these are all uh, details which the Lord orchestrates. So if we in our ministry are sensitive the way uh, Paul and his team were so sensitive to the leading of the Lord, um, we can flourish in our ministry you know, the way they did uh, because the Lord sees to it that you go to the right places, to the right people at the right time, you know. So uh, these are these things are arranged by the Lord. And if we are being guided by him, uh, our uh, ministry will be more fruitful. It will be more effective. So in this, um, so the first church gets planted, you know, in um, Europe. Uh, so uh, uh, you have Paul and Silas on the team. Uh, Timothy, of course, is also there with them. And then you have Luke. So um, we looked briefly at the background uh, last time uh, to how the church started. Uh, we saw that Lydia and a few other ladies were meeting outside uh, the city of Philippi by the river. And that's basically where Paul goes and uh, uh, ministers to them. Uh, so after that, Paul moved on to Thessalonica is what we find in the scriptures. So from uh, Macedonia, he, um, I mean, from Philippi, he goes to Thessalonica. But Luke stays back. So it, Luke, Luke is the one who actually stays back in uh, uh, Philippi, kind of develops the church over there in, in its uh, initial stages. Uh, so then, of course, later on, during the third missionary journey, I think it's a couple of times Paul again visits uh, Philippi. So he had good contact with this uh, particular Philippian church. One thing that we see about the Philippian church, uh, they have not yet been plagued by the uh, Judaizers. You know, so in, in uh, when we were looking at Galatians, we saw that uh, there was a large section of Judaizers in the church already uh, who were insisting that salvation is uh, through belief in Jesus as well as keeping the Mosaic covenant. Uh, so um, we don't have that issue over here. Um, maybe a few people had come to Philippi and spoken about uh, Judaism and the importance of that for salvation, but that had not become a big issue as yet uh, in this particular place. So last week when um, we, we started chapter 2 and we looked at that section which talks about uh, the mind of Christ and uh, uh, Paul tells the believers that they need to have the same mind as Christ. Uh, so we just saw that. Now um, we looked at how um, having the mind of Christ involves not holding on to our rights and privileges, uh, but being willing to give them up for the interests of the others. So we place others' interests before our own. And uh, if that involves giving up our 
rights and privileges, we should be willing to uh, do that. that. That is what Paul conveys in this uh, first portion of chapter two. Now, last time, you know, we didn't really uh, spend much time talking about Philippi, the city of Philippi and the background of that place. Um, I thought maybe we could um, you know, spend a little time uh, looking at that because um, that helps us understand uh, this passage better, uh, where Paul says, uh, we don't consider our own interests. We place the interests of others first uh, because that is how Christ, um, you know, um, uh, operated. That's the way he chose to uh, relate with people. And uh, uh, because you see, the people of Philippi had special rights and privileges. Uh, and so at least the rich among the congregation uh, might have uh, felt that they have a right to special treatment. Uh, so uh, now what we learn from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is that um, these Macedonian churches were quite poor. Uh, but at least in Philippi, we know that there were some wealthy uh, church members as well, because Lydia was a, a merchant dealing in purple cloth. So she must have been quite well off. We also get to know that uh, you know the jailer, uh, the one who uh, releases uh, Paul and Silas from the prison. Uh, so uh, he too. Uh, would have been well off because you know when we think of jailer, we are maybe just thinking of about a guard uh, in the jail. But no, this is actually the man who is running that entire uh, uh, prison system of Philippi. So he is obviously uh, somebody you know in uh, in a bigger position. So he too would have been well off. So at least the church in Philippi probably had a few rich, um, influential church members, uh, but overall. Uh, the Macedonian churches were quite poor. When we say Macedonian churches, we are basically talking about three churches. Um, Philippi, the church in Philippi, the church in Thessalonica, and also the church in Berea. So these are the three uh, uh, places in which churches were established. And most of them were extremely poor, is what we learn from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, so. Um, just to dwell a little bit upon the city of Philippi and the special status that this city had. Um, Philippi, uh, you know, it's there in your notes, in fact. Uh, in Philippi uh, actually started off as just a small village, uh, which was called Crenidus, uh, which basically means water springs, uh, because they had all these uh, water springs in that area. In fact, there were two rivers on either side of the city. Um, it was protected by mountains. It was very fertile. So this was a uh, place, a location, which was very attractive to all the conquerors. So um, Alexander the Great's father, uh, who was um, King Philip of Macedon, he decides to conquer this place and make it his own. And so, uh, you know, because his name is Philip, he chooses to name this place uh, as Philippi, you know, naming it after himself. And the main attraction uh, uh, for him uh, was the gold and silver mines which were there in this area. So Philippi, right from the time uh, it was a village, it was rich in status. You know, So uh, it was not exactly uh, one of those backwater places, but this was some, some, it was an important place. Uh, so um, later on, when Alexander the Great comes to the throne, he introduces Greek culture. Uh, into this uh, into this entire uh, you know region so philippi becomes very um, greek in its culture and its thinking um, you know it had all these intellectuals uh, interacting in 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 the city so it was like one of those um, more uh, developed and posh places so later on when the romans took over you know when when um, the uh, Romans conquered this place. Um, it was when they had this battle of Philippi. Um, so that took place over here. And anyone who had to study the old ICAC syllabus, you know, where we used to have that uh, Shakespearean play on Julius Caesar, uh, would be familiar with the details of all that took place. Uh, you know, Julius Caesar had uh, two friends 
whom he trusted greatly, Brutus and Cassius. Um, you know, we I remember we had to study all of this when you know in in our school days. Uh, so um, he is very shocked when his uh, the, when the people whom he has trusted most uh, you know uh, closely they betray him. So in fact, as he's dying. Uh, I mean, at least according to the Shakespearean play, even as Brutus is stabbing him, he looks at him and he says, you too, Brutus, and he just, you know, falls down and he dies. Uh, so all of that takes place. Uh, Mark Antony, who is faithful to uh, Julius Caesar, um, he later on defeats Brutus and Cassius. Uh, and uh, so all of those things happen here. This is the arena where all of this takes place. So. Um, after the Romans took over this place, Philippi, um, they did not just give it to the local leaders to run it. Uh, in most places, the local leaders would just pay a monthly tribute to Rome, but they would be in charge of the administration and the running of the place and the decision making and all of that. But Philippi was considered so important, especially because of the resources it had uh, that Rome decided to have a direct control over it. So it was not the local leaders who were running Philippi. It was the Ro directly the Roman um, officials who were stationed over there to run that city. So the people of that city had Roman citizenship. You know, like Paul, who was born in one of those places where, which had Roman citizenship. Um, so like that, uh, even this Philippi, uh, the people living here, had uh, special citizenship rights. So uh, it was a privilege to be part of Philippi, which is why I believe that you know, even though the Macedonian churches as such were highly poor, um, in Philippi at least, some of the members would have been from influential backgrounds. They would have had some wealthy people among them. Uh, so therefore, you know, when Paul is talking to them, he says, Christ, knowing his status, knowing that he's equal to God, instead of taking advantage of his rights and privileges, he lays them aside so that he can place others' interests before uh, uh, you know, his own. And uh, he urges these people of Philippi, who probably have special rights and privileges, knowing their status is uh, high, they should be willing, just like Jesus, to lay that status aside and uh, you know, serve the interests of others, placing others' interests before their own. Uh, so at least some of the congregation here uh, would have adopted the, you know, the Greek culture and, and their style of dressing. And in fact, uh, they were fluent not only in Greek, but also in Latin. So they had advantages, which probably the um, you know, the Thessalonian church members and the Berean church members would not have had. Um, this was the place where um, agriculture uh, was you know, at a higher level uh, because of the very fertile land. Uh, this was the place where they had a, a school of medicine, a famous school of medicine. So people would come from uh, the entire region to study over here. Um, also, they had these paved highways because of all the, um, you know, all the important um, people who, who used to visit this place. So they had paved highways and roads and all of that. So if someone were to um, come to Philippi, it would look like a mini Rome. You know, that's basically uh, how it was. So in a place like that, uh, with all of its um, worldly stature, Paul is telling the congregation to keep their eyes on spiritual things, you know, not to get puffed up, uh, not to get led away by the things of the world, but to stay focused and centered on uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so most of the people, of course, were poor, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the rich among them, he uh, is kind of urging them to follow the example of Christ and to have the mind of Christ. Uh, so. Um, what he is saying would have made sense to these Philippian believers because just like them, he too had Roman citizenship. You know, so he, he, he knows what perks and privileges are involved in being a Roman citizen. And uh, the, uh, many in the Philippian congregation also had that same 
status of being Roman uh, citizens. Uh, so uh, when he spoke to them about the kingdom of God and how your focus should be different and how you should have the mind of Christ, they would have taken him seriously because he's speaking as someone who understands these things. Uh, so they would have you know, taken him seriously. In um, last time, we could not cover certain things. I thought maybe we could just touch upon that. You know, in chapter 1, um, uh, in um, verses 9, 10, and 11, there's, uh, there's a point which Paul makes. Uh, he says that this is what we should be focused on. Um, so if anyone could turn to Philippians chapter 1, and if they could just read out for us verses 9, 10, and 11, uh, let's look at what uh, Paul says over here. Uh, Philippians 1, verses 9, 10, and 11, please. And this is my prayer, that you love, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Yes, thank you. Uh, that was a good translation. It talks about how this love that these believers have, you know, he praises them, right? He's, he's very happy with the way they have conducted themselves so far. He, he, he's joyful whenever he prays for them uh, because of their, of their active partnership in sharing the gospel and all of that. So he says, I want you to continue abounding and growing in love. And um, all of this uh, Christ-like love that you are abounding in, it must lead to two things. First, it must lead to an increase in knowledge. And second, it must lead to an increase in insight. You know, like that particular translation which Brother read out. Um, it says, um, in, in the NIV, it says, in, a, you know, increase in discernment. Uh, but I think um, increasing in insight is a better way of saying it. Because as a believer, on a daily basis, there are so many different situations that we would, um, you know, face. In each of those situations, how to handle it, how to honor Christ, you know, what would be the right decision to take in, in, in that uh, setting. So to, to have that kind of divine insight into how to conduct yourself in different situations, that kind of an insight, that kind of a discernment, it comes um, if you are having a close walk with God. So here he says, I, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. So knowledge wise, uh, you know, like we have uh, said again and again, it does not talk about intellectual knowledge. It's talking about experiential knowledge where you're getting to know the Lord more and more intimately, where you know his heart and mind more clearly. And uh, because of that, uh, because you understand him, his mind, you are also becoming more like him. You think like him. Your views are now uh, matching his views. You know, So in that sense, you increase in knowledge. And you also increase in insight. You are able to take decisions more wisely because of this closer walk that you have with the Lord. And why do you need to increase in knowledge and insight? It's because. Um, then you will be able to uh, you know, decide what is best, how best to act in different situations. In the NIV, it says that you may approve the things that are excellent. What is excellent? What is best? You would choose those things. Those would be your priorities. Um, so Paul, even though he was a very um, highly qualified Pharisee, even though he had very high status, even though he had Roman citizenship, even though he had all of these things, he says, see, these are the things that have been the focus of my life. And you need to follow that same example and be like that, because then your priorities would be right. And he talks about that, in fact, in chapter 1, um, in uh, verses 19 and maybe from 19 up to 25, um, if we could read out, uh, we would see how, you know, having this kind of a, 
uh, knowledge and this kind of a discernment, how it affected his perspective, how it affected his outlook, uh, and you know what was valuable, what was important to him in his uh, in his life. We see that in uh, verses 19 to 25 of Philippians chapter one. Philippians one. 19 to 25, please. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, up to 25, all the way up to 25. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Because uh, Paul, you know, um, grew in knowledge and in discernment, his whole perspective changed. I mean, he is not afraid of death. He has no issues with being uh, martyred. In fact, he says, um, uh, he, he says in verse 23, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. I mean, um, uh, you know, most of us believers, we would like to continue here on earth, at least for a few years. Uh, if not many years, uh, because I mean, we have families here. God has given us a life here. Uh, there are things that he has provided for us. Uh, so we are quite happy to be here. Uh, but uh, Paul, because of his close walk with God, uh, he has his entire worldview, his entire perspective has changed so much that he's perfectly content to be here. I mean, if God needs him to be here, but he's also quite happy with the idea of uh, departing and going and being with Christ physically. So we, we see that um, his entire worldview has changed. Um, so which is why when he's talking about how, uh, uh, you know, what has happened to him, this arrest which has happened, the court case which is going on when he talks about it, uh, he says, I'm quite happy about this because as a result of this, the uh, gospel is getting advanced. You know, is what he says. We we looked at that uh, last time. Um, so here in these verses, which we read out now, he says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit. So is he saying that he's very, very sure that he is going to be delivered, that the court case will, you know, find him innocent and he would be set free? Is he talking about that? Not really, because when you look at the next verse in verse 20, he says, whether by life or by death, you know. So what kind of a deliverance is he talking about? He's basically saying, I don't know what the verdict is going to be here in, you know, in Caesar's tribunal on this earth. I don't know what kind of a, uh, what kind of a judgment would be given to me. But what I'm, uh, you know, more concerned about is the heavenly verdict, which God is going to give me. So he says, um, that it is his uh, earnest desire that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, Christ would be magnified in my body. So he's saying, I don't mind, you know, what kind of a judgment is given to me over here on this earth, uh, even as this court case is going on. Maybe I would be set free. Maybe I would be killed. It doesn't matter. But when it comes to the heavenly verdict, this will definitely work out for my deliverance because you people are praying for me. You people are interceding for me. And also the Holy Spirit is supplying, you know, his enabling grace and power to me. So based on this, I know that I am going to successfully handle this entire court case. So he, he is confident um, about uh, his outcome in the heavenly verdict. 
So we as believers, even as we are living on this earth, we should always be more concerned about what is the heavenly verdict regarding my actions today. What is heaven thinking about uh, you know the, the the choices which I have made today? So we should always be more concerned with the heavenly verdict rather than the uh, verdict which people may pass. Because sometimes you know the um, ministry efforts that we are making may be appreciated, they may not be appreciated. Um, you know, uh, we may receive applause, we may not receive applause. There are ups and downs when it comes to you know human opinion. So if we keep our eyes focused on what the Lord thinks, how He views what we are doing, it helps us to keep our priorities right. So even if nobody is praising us for what we are doing, we will have that joy that the Lord is pleased that Christ is being magnified in what I am doing on a daily basis. And that becomes enough. That becomes sufficient. So even when there is no applause at all, it will not matter because you, you are doing your best. You know, in nothing are you being ashamed, but Christ, your Christ is honestly being magnified in your choices, in your lifestyle, in your, in your work. And uh, that will bring deep satisfaction. So Paul has become like that. His focus is so um, uh, Christ-centered. Uh, you know, he's not really thinking in, in worldly terms anymore. And uh, so he says in verse 23, I am torn between the two. It's like he would love to just go and be physically with the Lord, to actually be able to see him, talk to him uh, physically. He, he, he would love to do that. But he's also aware that Christ has given him a responsibility down, down here on earth. And so he says in verse 24, it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So for the sake of that, he is willing to stay over here if need be. You know, even though it's going to involve more persecution, it's going to involve more hardships, uh, he doesn't mind. You know, so uh, either way, he's, he's, he's glad. Uh, so he says, you know, uh, it's more necessary that I should stay here. So if that is how things go, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So his entire priorities, um, his entire value system is now centered around Christ. So it's not important to him that he is the Pharisee of Pharisees. It's not important to him that he's a Roman citizen. Because, I mean, those are the things which we value, you know, on, on Earth. Um, uh, when people here in uh, India, they want to go to the U.S. and become green card holders, uh, you know. Um, so it's like these um, uh, earthly things which make us, you know, rank ourselves and decide, okay, how much status do I have in life? I mean, uh, what is my uh, wealth? Uh, you know, um, how much influence do I have? What are the kind of social circles that I move in? You know, those are all the things which matter. And even us believers, we tend to rank ourselves according to those you know, criteria. But when you become like this, you know, um, uh, in, into this kind of person that Paul is urging the Philippian believers uh, to be, uh, when we become like this, our priorities change. It will not really matter whether you're a green card holder or not. It will really not matter to you uh, whether you know you have a huge bank balance and whether the the the, the best people in the city are inviting you to their uh, you know uh, social functions and occasions. That will not be important. You will be asking yourself, what is the heavenly verdict? What is Christ thinking about me? Is He getting magnified in the way I am living? Uh, so uh, Paul is drawing the believers' eyes, the Philippians' eyes, away from the special status that they have in Philippi onto more important things, onto heavenly things. Um, so with this background in mind, you know, having talked about all of these things with them, now he comes into chapter 2, you know, the portion which we just kind of started off last time. And he says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So he says, do not get you know, um, um, distracted by worldly things. 
your first priority should be working out your salvation with fear and trembling that should be the main priority so um that would be chapter 2 verse 12 so um you know we read out that last time uh, but then there was no time for us to get into the explanation of what that particular phrase means uh, so um if you were to look in the greek you know uh, it literally says your own salvation continue to work out your own salvation now of here over here paul is not saying that you know just look after your own spiritual growth and don't care about other people no he's obviously not saying that um he's saying that each of us has a personal responsibility for our own growth he means it in that sense in the sense we can't always have leaders chasing after us asking us you know have you read your bible today uh, are you growing in the lord are you uh, you know um, accepting correction and uh, changing your ways on a daily basis we can't always expect someone to chase after us and and force us to grow spiritually it's our personal responsibility each person has a responsibility to work out their own salvation you know god has given this privilege uh, given us the privilege of being part of his family of uh, being a part of the um, body of christ so now that we have received this privilege we need to work out our salvation we need to work on our own growth and whether we are you know magnifying christ more and more in our in our life in our choices in our body all of that uh, so uh, in fact when we were doing galatians also we saw that right there were two terms in galatians um chapter 6 it's uh, paul says uh, he says carry each other's burdens and he also says everyone should carry their own load and over there we saw that there were two different greek words that were being used there are some things uh, which a believer cannot handle on his own you know especially if he has backslidden and he's not able to come back you know um, um, into the fold on his own then people need to go with uh, go to him stand with him pray with him encourage him so in that sense we should carry each other's loads but he says just because you know you're going and helping other people with their uh, with their burdens it doesn't mean that uh, you're in any way superior please watch out for yourself test yourself on a daily basis make sure that you are also you know holding yourself accountable and growing on a daily basis so he says that very clearly in galatians chapter 6 so he says each person must carry their own load so here in that same sense uh, he, when he's talking here to the philippian church he says continue to work out your own salvation he says um so what exactly is does this phrase mean working out your salvation does it mean that we have to add good works to the belief that we have placed in the lord jesus no it's not at all talking about salvation by works that term that is used over there is a greek word um uh, it's kater gazomai or however on earth you pronounce that uh, but that word that work out that word work out it's basically saying um to create or to produce something that word cut uh, it basically talks about creating or producing something so in what way do you create or produce your salvation it's talking about the works that you're producing let them be in line with the salvation which you claim that you're having so if you say that you're a believer if you say that you have salvation then please produce works create works which are which will demonstrate and show that yes you are saved so he says don't take the salvation which you have received lightly i mean a very great privilege has been granted to you so now show that you value this by living in a way which is producing fruits of salvation you know the choices that you're making the the the, the way that we uh, interact with the people around us uh, the 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 passion with which the, the sacrifices with which we do our ministry work all of these things work out produce create fruits works which are in line with the salvation which has been given to you so if you truly have salvation 
it will show up in the kind of uh, fruit that you're producing, the kind of works that you are creating. So in that sense, we need to work out our salvation. Each person has a responsibility to carry their own load and work out their salvation in this sense. Because I mean, we, we as we are aware, you know, we have the initial salvation experience when we repent and then the Holy Spirit, you know, um, makes us into a new creation. That's the initial salvation experience. And then you have the ongoing salvation experience, which goes on on a daily basis. That would be the process of sanctification, where we are choosing to lay aside the old uh, ways of life, the old thought patterns. And we are trying to become more Christ-like. Um, like we uh, read in uh, Ephesians, you know, we are putting on the new thought patterns, the new way of life. So that's an ongoing sanctification process. And that is basically what Paul is talking about. So you, in that sense, you are working out your salvation. You are getting more and more sanctified and bringing yourself in line with the salvation which has been given to you. So in that sense, he says, work out your salvation, create, produce works and fruits which are in line with the salvation that has been given to you. And the, the final um, stage of our salvation experience will be the glorification which will happen when Jesus comes back and he would give us our resurrected bodies. So salvation basically has three stages. You have the initial stage when the person repents and the Holy Spirit uh, makes them into a new creation. Then you have the ongoing salvation experience where sanctification takes place on a daily basis. And the final, um, the final, uh, the work of salvation is, is achieved when Christ glorifies us by giving us, I know, um, resurrected bodies, the same, uh, the same kind of resurrected body that he has, uh, we too will have one day. Uh, so, um, so we need to produce and create works that are in line with our salvation experience. And how are we to do it? With what attitude are we to do it? Do it with fear and trembling is what he says over here. It's not talking about being scared that maybe we will lose our salvation. It's not talking about that kind of a negative fear at all. So when he uses the term fear and trembling over here, it's talking about something else. This is a term which he uses four times in his letters. Paul uses this term four times. And in all the four places, he means it in a particular sense. So let's actually look at that. Um, if we could um, maybe look at the first occurrence of this term. First uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, if someone could please read out. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Yeah, if you could have someone unmute and please read out for us. First Corinthians 2, verses 2 to 4. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. For I determined not to know any, anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words, of human wisdom, but in demonstration of this, of the spirit and of power. Amen. Yes. So um, look at the context in which he uses this term fear and trembling. Now, obviously, he's not saying that he's scared because he makes that very, very clear. You know, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, we have not been given a spirit of fear. So he's not saying that he's scared, that he's timid. He doesn't know what how the Corinthians are going to react when he goes and preaches to them. No, he's not scared of them. You know, so it's not talking about that kind of a fear. Rather, he explains the attitude with which he has gone to these Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 2 to 4, he says, I resolved, I made up my mind to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
you know you you had all these preachers coming to the corinthian church they were an influential church you know everyone wanted to to be the guest speaker over there you know it's like a it's like a honor to be invited to the corinthian church to preach over there so um, you know people would come over there and give grand speeches and uh, very uh, you know um, very interesting uh, sermons and teachings and all of that so if someone was it was able to have uh, uh, grand oratorial skills and be able to speak in a very impressive manner people would say wow look, the way he spoke the depth you know uh, of uh, of his knowledge he seems to know all about the latest philosophies he seems to know all about the greek thought uh, you know uh, so uh, they would they would think highly of people who are able to speak big things though because for the greeks in, in the greek culture oratory was a was a very um, grand skill to be able to you know um, present philosophical thoughts in a very um, in a very grand manner uh, with much depth and probably half the people would not even understand what is being said so you know the deeper it sounds and the more complex it sounds the greater you are or something like that you know so paul when he comes to them he says i resolved i made up my mind that when i come and talk to you i'm not going to be high fi in any way i'm just going to talk to you about jesus christ and that to jesus christ crucified you know which is like a very humiliating thing you know we talked about that how that term cross was not even considered a respectable term and all of that so he says i came to you in weakness not in strength you know all these people they they come to you and they preach uh showing off their skills i decided i'm going to come to you in weak and my my only strength is going to be this gospel that i'm sharing so in that sense i'm going to be coming with great fear and trembling with great humility so that term that he's using over there it's talking about humility where he's not going to pretend to be high fi like all these greek orators he's just going to come and in weakness in humility and is just going to talk about jesus christ and that to christ crucified is that's what he's going to talk about and he says so he says that he you know he clarifies that in verse 4 he says my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the spirit's power so all he did was talk to them about the cross talk to them about what jesus christ achieved on the cross and then the holy spirit demonstrated that what he's talking about is the truth by you know um doing works uh, and showing the people that yes this is the truth so the holy spirit did um, uh, miracles the holy spirit uh, showed uh, that what paul is preaching this weak sermon of a crucified christ which paul was preaching the holy spirit backed up this preaching with demonstrations of power so he chose to be humble and he chose to present the plain gospel not using any kind of oratorial skills or anything of that of that sort so that same term which he uses over here fear and trembling that is the, that term is used over here in the philippian letter and he says when you're working out your salvation take it seriously be humble you know understand how how privileged you are to be to be made a part of the family of christ so now please produce works you know create works which uh, show how grateful you are for what god has given you so live in that manner live in a way which shows that you truly are saved and that you truly have salvation just for our knowledge the other two places where you have this term fear and trembling mentioned um one place would be second corinthians chapter 7 verse 15 uh where it says and his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient receiving him with fear and trembling I'm not sure who's being received over here um i don't know for that i would actually have to go over there and look it up um but yeah uh, so in second corinthians 7:15 even if anyone could just turn there quickly um so there's somebody who is being uh, received 
and they are receiving him with humility they are willing to accept whatever he's coming and sharing with them uh, whatever he's preaching to them they are willing to humbly accept that so fear and trembling it's not that they're scared to receive him they are not afraid of him that's not the way the term is being used rather they are humbling themselves and with humility they are accepting whatever he has uh, you know to share with them um then uh, the other place where uh, fear and trembling is mentioned that would be ephesians 6 5 there of course it's talking about slaves how they would serve their masters with fear and trembling again it's not talking about negative fear of you know being beaten or being whipped it's talking about humility humility and sincerity of heart with that attitude they choose to serve their masters because it's not just their human masters that they are serving but rather they are serving christ himself uh, so in all of these four places where the term fear and trembling is used it's talking about paul's uh, attitude of it's talking about an attitude of humility yeah um so uh, why are we supposed to work out our salvation with a humble attitude uh, why because it says in verse 13 uh, philippians chapter 2 verse 13 for it is god who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose so the determination that we need to obey is given by the lord and the power to be able to obey is also given by the lord so god is the one who's doing it he is going to help you to want to bring uh, bring out fruits of salvation he's, he's he'll give you the the desire and the willpower and the inclination to to produce fruits of salvation he will do that he will give you the desire to do it the willpower to do it he will also give you the enabling power to actually act out and live out in that way you know to make those sacrifices to make the right choices so in fact everything is doing from his side all he needs from our side is a little cooperation. So we, if we can humble ourselves and say, okay, Lord, I lay aside the things that, you know, are against you. And yes, I am willing to make those sacrifices. I will humble myself to so the term fear and trembling. It's talking about humility, where you humble yourself and say, okay, Lord, what you're asking of me, I shall, you know, uh, gladly sacrifice and give up for your sake. So he is the one who has give us, gives us the determination to, to do this. He is the one who gives us the enabling power to actually make those sacrifices and step out in obedience. From our side, we just need to humbly cooperate with him and um, you know uh, work along with him in producing those uh, fruits and works of salvation. So Paul is urging the people to live in this way. Um, so that they, uh, you know, so that they will honor and glorify Christ through their lifestyle. So now, when we come back from the break, um, maybe we can continue from verse fourteen onwards. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 